everything that's published in peer-reviewed science is not counted as revealed dogma to scientists. There's no such thing as dogma in science. Any, any result is, is expected to be uh, potentially overturned with new evidence. The Rational View is a weekly series hosted by me, Dr. Alan Scott, providing a rational, evidence-based perspective addressing important societal issues. Hello, and welcome to another episode of The Rational View. I'm your host, Dr. Al Scott. On this episode, I want to talk about healthy skepticism, and I want to go into a little bit about the statistics uh, behind scientific discovery announcements and the thought process behind science and the fact that science is not dogma. Science is, an, is a process which approaches the truth or truth with a small t, as my previous guest, Dr. Michael Shermer mentioned. We don't know anything about truth with a big T or what the true universe is like. What we do through science is we approach an understanding of the universe that we find ourselves in and that we can interact with. And we, through the process of science, get results that get us closer to understanding how things work in the universe as we perceive it. And so it makes no claims to truth or meaning, but I want to talk a bit about skepticism and move on a little bit. I've been focusing quite a bit on nuclear power and environmentalism, and now I want to look a little bit more at thought processes in science and skepticism, as any of, anyone who listened to my last podcast would understand. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you for listening. If you enjoy what you're hearing, press like, provide a comment perhaps, and, and spread it around to your friends. Uh, we're trying to grow a community uh, and a discussion group on Facebook uh, where a lot of my interviewees are showing up to answer questions on the podcasts. It's facebook.com slash groups slash The Rational View. So skepticism, the biggest divide between religion and science, I think, is in the value of skepticism. And science is just applied skepticism. So this, I think, is where the uh, apparent contrast or, or conflict between science and religion comes from. Religions push faith as a primary virtue, and many religions dissuade questioning of the premises upon which it is based. But in the practice of science, faith masquerades as a four-letter word called bias. And this mindset, I think, has been used against scientists in the popular media because, you know, the majority of people in society are religious people and have been brought up on the Bible. And the Bible says faith, hope, and love are three of the greatest things that you can have. Uh, so it's in the top three, right? Faith. And in science, it's right in the bottom. It's, it's the worst thing you can have because you're fooling yourself if you have faith in something beyond faith is is belief in something in the absence of evidence in science in science that's a dirty word so this mindset is used against scientists in the popular media it's one reason i hated watching uh, the x files for example the scientific uh, person on that would always be skeptical but the, the woo guy would be like, oh, the truth is out there. And, and he'd always be proven right. <laughs> you know, oh, your skepticism is misplaced. You, must, you should have believed there were aliens doing this stuff. And it's, oh, God, I couldn't watch that. It was horrible. <sighs> and yeah, sure, it was, a, it was a fun thing. And a lot of people liked it, but I just couldn't watch it. Scientists are, are kind of portrayed in Hollywood as faithless infidels. And a big... Uh, jab against scientists is don't you believe in anything you can't believe in anything if you're an atheist i think uh, one of my scientific idols richard feynman a, a famous american physicist uh, said it best when he said i think it's much more interesting to live not knowing than to have answers which might be wrong i have approximate answers and possible beliefs and different degrees of uncertainty about different things, but I'm not absolutely sure of anything. And there are many things I don't know anything about, such as whether it means anything to ask why we're here. I don't have to know an answer. I don't feel frightened not knowing things, 
by being lost in a mysterious universe without any purpose, which is the way it really is as far as I can tell. And that takes a certain bravery, I think, to hold such a position. Uh, it's a scary thing to to be lost in a universe, and, and that's one of the, the attractions of religion. It gives people certainty. And a lot of people can't live without this certainty of purpose and this certainty of reward. So I think popular media is is biased a little bit against scientists because of their skepticism. And skepticism is seen as a bad word in society, as the X-Files example uh, represents. But what does skepticism mean and how can you have an appropriate amount of skepticism? So, so what I want to do with this podcast is to help you understand how to apply skepticism to clickbait results and wow journalism because often scientists publish papers scientists publish papers all the time in peer-reviewed journals and you need to have a healthy skepticism even to peer-reviewed science because everything that's published in peer-reviewed science is not counted as revealed dogma to scientists there's no such thing as dogma in science any any result is is expected to be uh, potentially overturned with new evidence and as a scientific person, as a skeptical person, what you do is have to weigh the evidence on both sides. And that's difficult. A lot of people don't have time to do this. And a lot of people are basically just listening to their leaders who can lead them astray unless you have the proper leaders. And uh, obviously, I would argue that people involved in the scientific process are the ones that are going to lead you closer to a result, which is in keeping with the universe as we see it. So how do you... Uh, judge a scientific result and how do you do you suddenly change your lifestyle if people put out a a, a peer-reviewed paper that onions are bad for your health do you stop eating onions immediately no 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 you investigate you look around what's the strength of the new result is it a a very clear signal or is it a statistical just barely above a statistical threshold that the result was was discovered. Has it been reproduced? Is there evidence against it? Is there strong evidence against it? If you're, if a new result is overturning an accepted theory, and this theory has passed a lot of tests to get where it is, then the new results don't have the strength to overturn the theory. And what what it does is it tells scientists, wait, there's here's an, something we need to understand. Why would this result contradict our current understanding and then a lot of scientists are going to be interested in that and go investigate that and then the next round of papers that come out are going to say well this this result still stands i've found more confirming evidence for it or someone else will overturn it and 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 it will be um thrown out so in this way science is self-correcting and it's not immediately self-correcting but upending an accepted theory requires a lot of evidence and as an example I want to talk a little bit about the replication crisis. And you may or may not have heard this, but starting about 10 years ago in 2010, 2011, high profile attempts to replicate important psychological, uh, social science results showed that roughly half of accepted results and published papers could not be reproduced using the scientific method. And this indicated that there was a problem in the standards for acceptance of new results or published papers. And for this, I'm going to have to go a little bit into mathematical statistics. And some of you probably know all about this and you could skip ahead a little bit. But I want to go through and give a little grounding in the statistics that you need to have or you need to understand to see when scientists believe a result is significant and how they what thresholds they use to publish uh, something based on statistics. So scientists publish clinical studies, and this is in social sciences, it's in uh, biological sciences and medicine, based on mathematical tools of statistics. And unfortunately, statistics, the, the quote, I forget who, it, who said it, but you know, there's lies, there's damn lies in statistics. And that's true. Statistics can be used to fool you, and they can fool you. Uh, so that's why I want to give you a bit of a grounding here. So scientists perform a study on a large number of people and correlate the results with a variable that they're trying to test. Now, 
to understand statistics, you need to know something about normal statistical distributions or bell curves effectively. And you've all seen the bell curve. The uncertainty in a measurement or the width of this bell curve is basically the square root of the number of samples in the bell curve. If, if it's kind of a binomial one zero result that they're measuring. In particle physics, new results are not accepted until they reach a statistical significance of 99.99994%, or basically five sigma, five times the width of the, of the bell curve. Okay. And so that's, that basically shows that if you have a measurement that's beyond that, it's very unlikely to be random, a random chance occurrence, you know, one in a uh, hundred thousand kind of thing, one in a million almost. So in social sciences and biomedical clinical studies, a 95% certainty is accepted for publication typically. And that's only two submit twice the width of the bell curve. In that case, you can uh, have a, have a random result one in 20 times. So you would expect based on that threshold that one out of 20 studies published is just randomly positive. But the reality when, when scientists went back and tried to reproduce these studies is that it was 50% were unreproducible. That's surprising and not at all what you would expect. So why the difference between particle physics, say, and the social studies of humanities and medical studies. Well, okay, for 100 measurements, the square root of 100 is 10. So the width of the distribution, the one sigma is 10, if you're making 100 measurements, so 10% uncertainty. Only once you make 400 measurements of a yes, no question, can you reach a statistical uncertainty of 5%. So for a humanities study, this means you need to sample 400 people uh, to get to that level, a minimum of 400, if, if you have a, a yes, no question. So let me, let me start with examples. If you're in an area, for example, that averages nine cancer deaths per year, then the uncertainty in that is the square root of nine or three. And the uncertainty tells you that 68% or the one sigma uncertainty, 68% of the time you will be within that air, that range. That's one sigma, two sigma is 95% of the time you'll be within six of the average. So what this means is that if you have an average of nine over the long term, nine de cancer deaths per year, then you would expect that 68% of the time you would go between six and 12 deaths. And that's not unexpected. That's a, a typical, that's a typical range of random occurrences. For something to be statistically significant in biomedical or humanities, you need two sigma. So if you suddenly went between went to three or 15 deaths, then you would suspect that something was happening out of the ordinary and you could publish a paper on that. In particle physics, you need to go five sigma, so 15 away from the, the, the mean, which was nine. So in particle physics, you would have to have 24 deaths in a year before it would be accepted as a significant event. So another way to look at this and this is, this is for a very strong result. Now let's, let's, let's say you're trying to measure a weak correlation. You have a variable that weakly correlates with, with a driver. So let's say we wanted to know whether a new advertising method could increase our sales by 1%. Okay. So you've, you've got a website and you're selling something and you, you put a new advertisement out and you want to interview your clients. How many people should you test to see if there's been a difference. So let's say you know what your current average is, your current average purchasing probability is. If you sample 1000 visits and you're hoping to have a one to measure a 1% increase in sales, you would expect that 10 more people would be buying something from your website. But the normal distribution, the random occurrences of random occurrences tells us that the uncertainty in a thousand samples will be about 32 out of a thousand, square root of a thousand. So a thousand measurements won't be enough to tell you whether you are having a 1% effect. The uncertainty is larger than the effect or the, the typical variance or variation in your measurement 
is larger than the effect if you only have a thousand visits. So you actually have to go up to say, if you have 40,000 visits, then you would expect a signal, your 1% of 400 extra visitors, and the uncertainty in 40,000 is the square root of 40,000 is 200. So now you have a significant result that you could publish in the humanities or biomedical response. If you show that you have 400 extra visitors on a sample size of 40,000, now you have two sigma as a result. Uh, you're twice the uncertainty. For physics, for particle physics, you would need to have 250,000 people visit your website uh, to show that you have a significant effect at 1%. So this is pretty straightforward math, but it gets tricky if you're measuring several things at once. Now let's say you're interviewing those same 40,000 people on a psychological questionnaire and you're tracking 20 different variables in your questionnaire, like how happy are you? How angry are you? Um, how successful do you feel? You've got 20 different things that you want to track in this, in this survey that you're giving people. And let's say you, after the test, you graph up your results uh, and look for correlations between your driving variable, whatever that is, giving people uh, alcohol, say, and how happy they are, how successful they are, and you see that you have, in one of the variables, a correlation of 400 extra yeses. So you've got 40,000 people tested, and one of the variables showed 400 extra yeses. Yes, I'm happier with alcohol. <laughs> this is a 95% significant effect, and you could publish your paper and pass peer review because it's meeting the statistical minimum standard for, for these for these fields. However, if there were no correlations whatsoever, if it was all random, 95% means there's a one in 20 chance that any correlation you see is bogus. And by searching 20 different variables, you've guaranteed yourself that one of them will likely appear significant just by random chance. So this is, this is interesting. Now you've basically guaranteed that you're going to find a correlation in one of your variables. And if you haven't told, if you didn't put that in your paper, if you say you hide the 19 negative results in your filing cabinet and only produce the one and say, we went to, de to detect whether alcohol makes you happier. And lo and behold, we found a two sigma correlation. Here's a paper. If you didn't say that, okay, we, we searched for night for 20 different things and tried to correlate them with alcohol, and only one of them came through, then people would say your result is bogus. And this is kind of, this is called Bayesian statistics. So the, the result in this case is probably a random outlier, but you begin to see how you might get bogus results, especially when you're a scientist who's under pressure to publish something significant. Now, what if everyone is only looking at five independent variables, say, and publishing at the 95% level. This would mean that one in four published results are bogus. So now you start seeing how we get to the position where in, society, in the scientific literature, 50% of these results are bogus. And what if many scientists are studying the problem and most of them are not motivated to publish negative results because it doesn't further their career? This would call into question any single finding of significance. And I think this is where we are right now. And we're stuck there because people don't publish negative results and they don't publish their hypotheses before they do the study. And by making these two changes, then we can get back to what we meant to be at when we were publishing 95% significant results. And this is why particle physics goes to 99.9999% certainty, because there are thousands of potential uh, correlations between particle energy and say uh, CERN particle accelerator experiments. So you need to have extremely high statistical significance before you're certain that this isn't just some sort of a random occurrence. And the branch of statistics that proper, properly assesses the null hypothesis or the fact that there may be no correlation at all a priori is called Bayesian statistics. Let me talk a little bit about what this means for, for, for popular um, acceptance of science and, and uh, digesting the results 
of, of scientific papers that have been promulgated in the media. So here's some examples of unrepeatable science that have been widely accepted as true and now are unable to be reproduced. So one of the studies that was done, power posing increases cortisol and testosterone and makes you take risky bets. So power posing, when you're standing with your arms on your hips, your legs apart, and you're supposed to stand at this power position for two minutes. And people did this study and they found that, look, uh, there's been a significant result. The original study had 42 participants. So there was a really significant result <laughs> because really you should be doing, you know, four, 400 people to, to get to the two sigma. But it could be that the blood results in cortisol were, you know, instead of a yes, no answer, it could have been a, a 200% or 300% increase in, in blood cortisol that they're measuring. I'm not sure exactly how it was done. I didn't read the paper. But a larger study of 400 people showed that this was not the case. So at 42 people, the result, it was referenced, it was in the, in the news. People do this now all the time to try and improve their, their mental situation, become more, more positive and more uh, assertive. Uh, apparently it doesn't work. Another one, a 1988 experiment, people were made to watch comics with pens in their teeth so that they were smiling while they were watching the comics. Or some of them were made to watch comics with pens in their lips so that they were frowning while they were watching the comics. And the result was in this 1988 experiment was that smiling will make you feel happier. And there were significant correlations. The paper received 1,500 references in the literature. It was published in the news. Repetition events attempts by 17 independent labs recently showed that there's actually no significant effect. So forcing yourself to smile does not necessarily make you feel happier. It's a bogus result. And there are several of these, right? 50% of the literature is shown to be false. It couldn't, for example, be shown that people subconsciously exposed to the concept of heat were more likely to believe in global warming. It couldn't show that the Lady Macbeth effect was true. Uh, moral transgressions creating a need for physical cleanliness in the style of Lady Macbeth. That's not a thing, apparently. And it was, it's was it got a Wikipedia entry. Uh, there was a study that said that people that grow up with more siblings are more altruistic. That hasn't been reproduced. So you see that a certain level of skepticism to scientific results is necessary amongst the public. And the public haven't been trained or taught that this is important. And as a result, the public can be manipulated by a press release. Scientists can put out uh, press releases or people that have a particular idea to push can manipulate the public by a press release because the public isn't su suitably skeptical and uh, media and journalists aren't suitably skeptical to scientific results and they breathlessly publish these things because they're short on content or they have a deadline. And I think journalistic standards in science are not uniformly good. But it's not just journalists who are at fault for being manipulated. It's our responsibility as educated populace and as a democratic uh, populace to not swallow clickbait headlines that reconfirm our biases. We need to check sources and we need to look for uh, confirming evidence or non-confirming evidence. Otherwise, we perpetuate the cycle of poor journalism by clicking on clickbait. This accelerates polarization in society and it's a big problem. So what I just wanted to do with this podcast is to kind of bring this to your attention that Science is not dogma. Science is a process and it's not always right. It asymptotically approaches better and it's always improving. In fact, the scientific process roots out counterfeits and false information. And the, the, the recognition of the replication crisis is science working. Now, it took a long time to get to this point to realize that if one in 20 studies are false by random chance and you have more than 20 scientists 
working on a topic and only one of them publishes, you got kind of a 50-50 chance that that's bogus. And that's why you need confirmation of large numbers. And that's why scientists now are going and doing meta-analyses of many smaller studies to make sure that the overall uh, weight of evidence is supporting or not supporting. So when you're looking to see if a medical result, for example, holds true, look for meta-analyses. And scientists doing their part are now being asked to publish negative results and make their data available for these meta-analyses to reach a stronger conclusion. So coming to the end of my, my discussion, this is basically what I wanted to tell you. Really appreciate you listening. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you learned something. Tune in again next week for some more interesting science. If you're enjoying what you're hearing, please consider visiting my patron page and becoming a patron of this podcast at patron.podbean.com slash the rational view.